Hello, this is Mr. Stevens coming to you from Portable M5. This is our video for 9.16 and for 9.17. So 9.16 is the A day, 9.17 is the B day. Uh, just so you know, this video is gonna be for four full days of class because this lesson will take two full days to complete. So we'll have an A day and a B day, which is the 16th and 17th spent on this. And we're also going to spend the 21st and the 22nd on this. So this video will span four full days of class. Um, you know, A day for the 16th, B day for the 17th, A day for the 21st, and B day for the 22nd. Hopefully that makes sense to you. <clears throat> Let's see. So we've got a few announcements to cover. Number one, the deadline to apply for CE or university credit for this class is the 18th, which I believe is a Friday. Let's double check the calendar here. Yep, it's, the, it's this Friday. So please sign up by then or there is a $40 late fee for registration. Also, you're able to sign up for Friday appointments with me or any of your other teachers via Edficiency. And if you need help doing that, I would like to encourage you to follow along here with me. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. We'll go, oh, which one is it now? I wanna make sure I get the right one. I think it's this one here. Okay, so if we go to our DSD Canvas and we log into it, you can go on the main modules page right here and scroll down to where it says how to schedule a meeting via Edficiency. And you can click on that and that We'll launch a video that will show you how to schedule that meeting. Let's go back to our lesson plan for the day. Um, we have a few announcements uh, still. Let's see, efficiency. The unit one test has been, ex the date has been moved out a little further. For A day students, it will be the 23rd. And for B day students, it will be the 24th of September. I wanted to give you extra time to work on today's assignment because um, it's, it's a long one and I want to make sure you have time in class to complete it and you guys at home working from home should have the same amount of time as students in class have. So that's why we bumped out the test a little bit. <clears throat> as always, make sure you have all of your definitions in your engineering notebooks, <clears throat> excuse me, and that'll be a good help for you to prepare for the test. Also make sure that as we go through class and we are talking about how you can know if you genuinely learned today's content, that you're able to answer those questions so that you can assess whether or not you understand the fundamentals of what's going on in class. That'll be very helpful. And in reality, you're the only person in the world who knows if you're understanding what's going on and if you're staying caught up. So that's a good thing to follow up with. All right, and I think those are all of our announcements so we can jump into our lesson plan for today. Uh, one quick technical note, we have a new microphone, which we're trying out today, and I think the sound quality should be a little bit better. So hopefully the sound quality is better on your end um, as we're getting started here and for today's video. All right, we're going to start with our ACT prep. I'm in the big fat ACT book on page 219. I'm on the bottom half. I'm going to stop sharing so you can kind of see what we've got going on here. This is the book. If you have a copy, awesome. If not, I'll just read you here what the folks in class are getting. So if you remember right, we are talking about strategies to help us do well on the math section of the ACT test. So we talked last time about um, some time management strategies. And today we're going to talk about overcoming overthinking. Overthinking a question can be one of the most frustrating things about taking the ACT math portion. It's very common for us to get in a cycle like this. Number one, we don't see how to do the problem right away. And the ACT folks who write these questions are very good at making sure that it, the answer isn't just glaringly obvious when we first read the problem. And so if we're used to questions like that from high school tests or you know, junior high school tests, the ACT can seem a little intimidating. And so when we see a problem like that, we assume the problem must be hard and typically it's not. They're just trying to figure out if you know how to do some critical thinking. And since we assume it's hard, we can't see how to do it. And it repeats itself. Since we can't see how to do it, we assume it's hard and the cycle goes on and on. <clears throat> so they really kind of mess up your momentum of doing well on the test and they're good at that. So here's a few strategies to overcome the overthinking elements. When this happens to us, we spend forever on a tough problem and get nowhere, only to find out that when we see the solution, it was far, far easier than we initially thought. So what are some bad beliefs that lead to consistently overthinking questions and some good beliefs that can help us avoid that? Well, bad belief number one, there are really tough math questions on the ACT test that I've never learned. 
That's not exactly true. I mean, think about it. You've been in school for how many years now? You've logged some serious hours in a classroom or online, however you've done your, your class. Um, the good belief that really counteracts that and what's the real truth, but really reflects reality is I have the tools, I just need to put the right ones to use. Somewhere in your schooling, you've heard how to solve a problem similar to this and you've got the tools to do it. The trick is just practicing enough and getting good at critical thinking so that you know how to overcome these specific problems. And we're gonna practice more of those at the beginning of class, but for now we're covering the strategy. The ACT is designed fundamentally as a critical thinking test first, a knowledge test second. This allows the ACT to show colleges that someone who may not have had the best opportunities to learn math, but who has quite a bit of math talent and ability would be worth admitting so that she can realize her full potential. Because of this, the math content goes no further than Algebra 2, Geometry, and Trigonometry. Thank goodness, no pre-calculus, no calculus, no differential equations, none of that, you know, really complex stuff. If you review the concepts earlier in the chapter, you can be assured that you will have the tools to figure out any problems that come your way. And we're gonna review those as the year goes on here in the first five minutes of class each time. We're almost done here. On the ACT math, think of yourself as a carpenter who will need to make a unique item using simple tools like a hammer and a screwdriver. You'll need to solve challenging problems, but you will only need to use relatively easy math concepts to do so. The difficulty is not with the material, but in figuring out what is being asked and how to set up your problem solving approach. So again, colleges want to see if you can problem solve and that's what they're looking for. And that's what the ACT really measures. So hopefully that's helpful to you as you work on overcoming overthinking in the ACT portion of the exam, uh, ACT math portion. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again here so you can see the lesson plan. There we go. Got the right one, I think. So we just finished up our ACT prep. Let's move on here. What are we doing in learning today? Well, we're talking about decision matrix and we're talking about writing a design brief. And then for activity, we're gonna make a carnival game. And in that carnival game, you'll apply the design process that we learned about you know, in the first week of school to creatively solve a problem. The, a copy of the design process should be uh, taped into page one of your engineering notebook. And then also we're gonna effectively use different types of models, conceptual, graphical, mathematical, to inform or to create and help really shape a design. So why should we care about a design matrix? Why should we care about learning about a design brief? And why should we care about today's activity? Well, to, do, to answer that question, we have to know a little bit about what they are. A design matrix is basically a systematized approach to pragmatically selecting the best alternative to an engineering problem or any problem for that matter. And a design brief is, basically a submittal or a um, document that really helps you articulate step one of the design process, which is understanding the problem. So let's talk about why we should care and how it helps us achieve our course goals. As always, we pull up our course goals and we can go back here to find what they are. Click here on our main Canvas page. And course goal number one is every time, safety first, always and forever. So today, in class, we've had students using scissors and we've had them using uh, cutting out different uh, pieces of paper and using a paper shearing device. So on that, we've just been really careful to make sure we don't get our fingers between the blades and that we don't you know, run with scissors and, and we're safe with them. Basic safety scissors stuff. Uh, goal number two, get exposure to how engineering principles are applied in industry and use this experience to address whether a career in engineering may be a good fit for you. Well, engineers all the time have to understand the problem before we can really effectively start working on it. And so the design brief is a tool that helps us do that. And if you enjoy really exploring a problem and getting into the nitty gritty and fleshing it out and making sure we thoroughly understand it before starting, then engineering could be a good fit for you. If, uh, if that's not something that appeals to you and you just kind of like to fly by the seat of your pants and understand things as you go, engineering or specific types of engineering may not be a good fit for you, but other types of engineering may be. So, and then in terms of design matrix and design matrices, every career has decision making involved. Whether you're a manager of a Starbucks, whether you pour concrete, whether you are an engineer, whether you're a doctor, you have to make decisions. And a decision matrix will help you in every aspect of your life, especially with difficult decisions. And you'll be able to see this decision making process and see if you wanna use it in what you do in your life. So, that's how it helps you understand if engineering might be a good fit for you or if it might not be. The important thing is, is that you know. All right, and course goal number three, learn the course material and Fusion 360 slash Excel skills well enough to earn university credit and the USBE certificate, earn the grade you want in this course and prevent school from getting in the way of our education. So the way learning about the design brief and the 
um, decision matrix helps us with this is that today's assignment will focus exclusively on that content. And if you do well on that assignment, it'll boost your grade in this class. Also, elements from this lesson will be on the test. And if you record them well in your engineering notebook and understand the concepts from class, you will do well on the exam. And that will also boost your grade in this class and consequently on your university transcript if you signed up for CE credit for this course. Let's see, let's close this out and go back to our lesson plan. All right, we talked about why we should care and I touched on other reasons why we should care because these making decisions is really a life skill. Hopefully this is something that helps you in other areas of your life. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how you can know if you genuinely learn today's content. Again, you're the only person that knows if you're understanding this. So here's a few ways you can check. Number one, you can do a self check. Can you comfortably answer the 1.1.5 conclusion questions? If so, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, the rando check, a rando again is just a random person. Could you verbally explain today's concepts to a stranger sitting next to you on an airplane? Now it doesn't need to be a stranger on an airplane. It could be anyone without an engineering background. Could you explain it to a sibling? Could you explain it to your parents using your own words? Could you explain it to your friend at lunch? If so, you're in good shape. And then lastly, your assignment check. Were you able to complete all of the assignment today? If so, you're in pretty good shape. So please conduct this self-assessment. Make sure you're getting the juice for the amount of squeeze that you're putting into this. All right, let's get to work. So we're going to review first the design brief. And if you are following along at home on your computer, you can just watch my screen or you can click on this link in the lesson plan and it will bring up the design brief or you can go to myPLTW.org and log in and you can see it there in 1.1.5 designing a game. So just so you know, the in person students picked up a printed sheet with a um, in, in class and they cut it to size and they taped it in their notebook so that they could uh, cut down on the amount of note taking they're doing. You can do that as well. If you click right here on the lesson plan, it's a printable version that you can tape in your engineering notebook to cut down on the amount of notes you need to take. Let me show you what that looks like. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. So this is the sheet right here that you're going to uh, download and print out and you can tape into your notebook then uh, this saves you from having to take a lot of notes. It's basically a time saver for you. So feel free to go ahead and download it, print it out at home, cut it to size and tape it into your notebook. If not, you can take notes and that's fine too. All right, let's go back to sharing the screen. Make sure we're sharing the right one here. All right, so let's get started and let's pull up the design brief. So, the design brief is really a written plan that identifies a problem to be solved, its criteria and its constraints. R completing a design brief encourages thinking through all aspects of the problem and it can serve as the deliverable for step one in the design process to find the problem. It really helps you define what your purpose is and what your creation is going to serve and what your creation or your product is going to address. So here is the portion that I've asked you to print out and put in your engineering notebook. If you're unable to print it out, you're welcome to copy it by hand in your engineering notebook, but please know that all of these will likely be on the test and you'll be responsible for this content. And you can put it in your engineering notebook and use it on the exam. What you're not allowed to do on the exam is just go to this page on PLTW's website. You need to have written this down or put it in your engineering notebook to use it on the exam. <clears throat> so, Imagine for a second that that I, or let's, let's put you in class, it's me, but uh, let's have it be you for the online class. Let's say that you manage and own a factory that makes pistons. A piston is something that goes in an engine and it goes up and down to help create power to make the engine go. And you make pistons for Rolls Royce to put in their airplane engines. You make pistons for uh, GM and for Ford you make to put in their vehicles. You make pistons for Yamaha and Suzuki and, Yam and Honda to put in their motorcycles. And Honda approaches you and says, hey, we've got this new motorcycle out. It's a Honda CRF 250X. It's one of the sweetest trail bikes out there. There's an R version that we have for, you know, uh, motocross, but, but the X version is really for trails. And we want to make sure that the piston that we have in our motor is better than other pistons in other competing motorcycles from Yamaha, Suzuki, Kawasaki, and KTM. And we want this Honda motorcycle to have a piston that gives it more horsepower and more torque on the trail, because you're going to make us a fantastic piston. We don't know how you're going to do it, but we want you to create something and make it exceptional. 
So you're thinking, oh great, this is a fantastic opportunity for my factory to make a little bit of money and to get a little bit of notoriety and this will be spectacular. So the client in this situation is gonna be Honda because you are selling pistons to them. That's the person, the company, the organization or group that requires the talents from an engineer or designer to develop a solution. Now you're the plant manager and the plant owner, you're gonna hire some engineers and hopefully you've already got some quality engineers on staff and they're gonna be doing this work of designing this piston for you. So the target customer are gonna be people who use the design. Is Honda your target customer? No, they're buying the piston from you and they're assembling it into a motorcycle. And that motorcycle is gonna to go to local Honda dealers where people like Mr. Stevens who like motorcycles is gonna go in and, and buy dirt bikes, right? So the target customer would be people like me or any motorcycle enthusiast who would buy and run a motorcycle. All right, so the designer, who's that gonna be? That's the creative person who's designing the solution to the problem or addressing the opportunity. In this scenario, you are the plant manager and you've hired engineers or you're gonna hire some engineers who are gonna help solve this for you. So that's who the designer is. All right, the problem statement. Now we've identified the who, let's start talking about some of the what's. A problem statement is a clear and concise identification and description of the design problem or opportunity. So in this case, Honda wants a piston that puts out more horsepower and more torque. So the design statement, and we'll talk more about problem statements in a minute when we scroll down on this page. Uh, the design statement describes what the anticipated design effort will address and the needs of the stakeholders. So we need to address the power out, the, the output of the motorcycle, and we also want the needs of Honda to be met. They wanna crush the competition. They wanna have a superior product. So that needs to be addressed in the problem statement. So what exactly will you do and provide as part of your solution? Well, that defines the scope of your project. So you're gonna create a piston that works a lot better than other pistons. Now let's talk about criteria. Criteria, this, you'll need this definition in your engineering notebook. So if you uh, are handwriting this and you're not gonna print it out, go ahead and pause here and make sure this gets into your notebook. Criteria is a list of, you need to list a, the specific concise design requirements that describe what the design solution must do and must meet the needs of stakeholders to be successful. It should be measurable. For example, how much more torque are they looking for? Do they want 2% more torque, 10% more torque? How much more horsepower are they looking for? Are they looking for a round number? Let's say right now that engine puts out 83 horsepower. Can we go to a round number of 85 or do they need to hit 90? What are they trying to get? Do they need 100? Let's just try and measure this. And then lastly, constraints. These are, you'll need the definition of constraints in your engineering notebook for the exam. The limits on the design and product and production of a product expressed with specific measurable values. These might include time constraints, budgets, codes, safety, or physical attributes, the weight, the color. You know, on this one, as the manufacturing or as the owner of the piston production plant, you're probably gonna wanna make money on this. And let's say it costs you, I don't know, 13 to $14 to make a piston, and you're gonna sell this to Honda for about $30. That's a standard markup, that's roughly 100%, you know, a little bit more. And maybe you wanna charge a premium for all the design work that's going into this. And since it's the first of its kind in the industry, maybe you're gonna to want to charge an even higher premium because you know, you've done all the engineer work and you're gonna to wanna to recoup some of that cost. So cost is a constraint. Let's say you only have two engineers and they're really busy with other projects. You're constrained in your engineering department. So uh, definitely consider all the constraints you have as you're going forward in the project. All right, we said we'd talk a little bit more about problem statements and here we are. Let's go through this example here uh, in just a second. A problem statement is a clear description of the problem and it allows you to focus your efforts and avoid wasting time working on a design that does not address the issue at hand. Clear problem statements provide information to determine whether a design is successful and if it actually solves the problem. So let's look at a terrible design statement and then let's look at a great design statement. So a terrible design statement is lots of people go fishing for redfish and they do not catch anything. There aren't as many redfish as there used to be. Well, that doesn't tell us a whole lot. Let's look at a better design statement that is much more articulate with respect to the problem. It, this new design statement is gonna tell us the who, the what, the where, the when, and how many. Here's, here's what a better one looks like. Game fishermen who fished in the lower Laguna Madre of Texas from 2002 to 2007 reported a decrease of 20% in red drum, i.e. 
I'm not great at biology. I'm, I'm going to kill this name. Cyanopus ostatellus. This is why I teach engineering, not, <laughs> not any of the <laughs> other sciences. This loss can be attributed to premature death due to mouth infections caused when undersized fish are caught and released. So we know the who, we know the what, we know the where, we know the when, and we know the how many. This is much more articulate and, we're, and it helps us attack this problem much more effectively than this very general kind of sloppy design uh, statement up here. All right, we've kind of gone through this uh, design brief and feel free to come back and review this as you're working on the assignment if you need to. So let's go ahead now and shift gears. We're gonna go back to our lesson plan and we finished reviewing the design brief. You've gotten your notes in your engineering notebook. Now we're gonna move on to reviewing the design matrix. Again, you can follow along by clicking the link here logging into myPLTW.org and locating design matrix in 1.1.5, or you can follow along with me on the screen. So decision matrix. <clears throat> design decisions should be based on analysis and logic, not personal opinion. Engineers and designers use a variety of tools to evaluate options and justify decisions. A decision matrix is one tool that can be used to compare potential design solutions against one another and provide evidence to help make you, help you make the design decision. All right, so here's the definition of a design of a decision matrix that you'll need in your notes for the test. <clears throat> so I think it's helpful to look at what one is before we talk about how to create one. Check out this uh, matrix right here. Here are all the competing ideas. You got six of them. And then here are the different criteria and constraints that we put up here. So let's go back to our motorcycle piston example. Let's say one idea to make a better motorcycle piston is to make it out of cast iron with a little bit of nickel in there. And the nickel helps it to expand and contract a little bit as the engine gets hotter and the sleeve widens up. Well, the piston's gonna widen up with it too because you're making out of, out of um, that specific material. Now the cost, it's that adding that nickel isn't that expensive. So that's great. On the one to five scale, let's give it a three, five being the best, one being the worst. And complexity, it's not very complex. Development time, hey, we just gotta put a little bit of nickel in the um, metal that we cast iron and we that we cast for these pistons and it's easy. So this is actually a pretty good idea. It gives us a six on the when we add up all of these numbers here. Now for idea number two, let's say we made this piston out of titanium. Well, that's gonna cost a lot more for raw materials. So I'm gonna give that a one in the cost. One's not very good, you know, and, and four up here being the best. Sorry, one to four scale, not one to five. And then in terms of complexity, hey, it's, it's not very complex at all. We just make the same design out of titanium. And then development time, well, we'll need to put a little bit into it, but not a whole lot. So that's gonna give us a total of four. Now let's say we come up with an idea number three, number four, number five, number six. And when we sum up all of the um, points that we have for ideas, we can see here that number idea number six gets the most points. It gets 11. So it's really the best idea that we've gotten. If we're being objective in this process, this matrix can really help us figure out the best idea for our application. So there's several steps used in making the design matrix. And I thought it'd be helpful to kind of show what it is first before we go back and attack these. Uh, step one is in the columns, right here, these are the columns, identify the criteria and constraints that you're gonna have for your project. And then the second step is to list the problem solution ideas in the ideas column. So here we had idea one, which was you know, a piston with a little bit of nickel in it. And then here we had idea number two, which was a titanium piston. And then we had idea three, four, five, and six. And then number three here in, in uh, setting up your de decision matrix is to create a rating scale. And down here, their rating scale was one is worst, four is best. And they also had a, a yes, no option here. One for no, two for yes. <clears throat> and then lastly, you wanna rate each solution idea against each criteria and constraint using the rating scale. And that's where it can be a little tricky. You wanna be as objective as you can. And sometimes getting an outside perspective on that really helps us to stay objective. And then last, sum up the rating values for each solution idea. Just like we did here, we found that idea number six with 11 points was the best idea. So hopefully you understand the concept of a decision matrix and that it's helpful to you as you go throughout the assignment. Let's go back to our lesson plan. Now we have finished reviewing the decision matrix. It's time to start our assignment. <clears throat> the assignment is posted on DSD Canvas. And so what you see right here, you'll see there as well. It's a simple copy and paste. And that's where you'll submit your assignment also. 
And your assignment is to complete all of the following. We don't get to just pick and choose bullet points unless you have an IEP or a 504 plan that says that you have a reduced workload, in which case, uh, please talk to me about which um, ones you want to do and let's get a plan together before you start on the assignment. Feel free to email me and we'll work that out. So number one is to read the Carnival Booth guidelines on PLTW 1.1.5. So I'm gonna log into my PLTW.org and go to 1.1.5. Here we are. Now I'm gonna scroll down to where it says Carnival Booth Guidelines. And to give you a little bit of context, let's go ahead and have you read this entire section right here. I'll go ahead and pause it and read it. All right, now that you've read that, go ahead and read the Carnival Booth Guidelines. Go ahead and pause it and you can read through this section. All right, now that you understand what we're doing in the assignment, you've completed uh, this bullet point and you have some context about what you're trying to do with this project. So the next bullet point here says, in your engineering notebook or in a Word slash Google document, complete the following numbered problems in PLTW 1.1.5, you know, carnival game. You need to do numbers two, three, four, five, seven, 10, 12, and 15. That is not all of them. We've had students in class who just kind of look up here and think, oh, I gotta do them all. Well, well you don't, look, you don't need to do number six, you don't need to do number eight and nine, you don't need to do number 11, or 13 or 14, or anything past 15. So that I've carefully chosen ones that I think are gonna give you the best bang for your effort and I try not to overload you. But I wanted to give you two days for this assignment because there is some time associated with it. So let's show you how to find number two. We're gonna go back up here to PLTW. We were just here reading the Carnival Booth guidelines and we're gonna scroll down till we start seeing some of these numbers. Here's number one. You don't need to do that one. You start with number two. Here's number two, as a team, now you can reach out to someone else in this class and work as a team or you can work on your own, it's up to you. If you work as a team and you decide to do this work in a Google document or in a Word document instead of in your engineering notebook, make sure that both of your team names are on that document because you wouldn't want to submit someone else's work as your own. If you're working in your engineering notebook, make sure you do your own work and you can submit pictures of that as part of the submittals. Again, it's up to you if you want to work on, um, on a Word document or a Google document or in your own engineering notebook, you decide there'll be a lot, of, um, a lot of typing on this one. So if it were me, I would probably go the route of working in a Word document or a Google document. Just know that when you submit your assignment to upload that document and um, make sure that you don't just send me a link because I'm unable to open those on my end through Canvas and the Weber State engineering team that assesses your work and the Utah State Board of Education who review this your submissions in Canvas, they won't be able to see them either. So a few things to keep in mind. All right, question number two. As a team, review the project, or review this document right here, this template. So open it up and go ahead and review it. All right, then you'll go on to 2A. Restate the problem to be solved in your own words in the problem statement section. Not too bad. Number B, complete the design statement to describe exactly what you will do as part of your solution. So you can see here as you go through, just read the problem and complete all the sections that it's asking for. Number two is probably the most arduous. And then you go on to number three, and then you go on to number four and five and so on. And you just follow what was assigned to you right here. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And when you get to number 12, that's where you actually make the game for the carnival. And when you're making the game, you'll need some poster board or, um, if you're at home in class, we're giving students poster board. If you want to come into my room and get some and take it home, you definitely can. If you'd like to just get regular pieces of paper, like printer paper like this and tape them together and to make the size of a, of a game you want to, you can definitely do that because those are things you have around the house. Please don't ask your parents to go buy stuff for this. You can definitely use what you've got around the house. You can, um, if you need to go out and use sidewalk chalk on the sidewalk and then take a picture of that, you can do it. If you want to, um, you know, get a old piece of plywood and cut holes in that. You can do that as well. If you've got some old cardboard sitting around from a cardboard box, you can use that as well. Just be creative and find something that works around the house. And if you have absolutely nothing, um, come to class and we'll give you some um, poster board and you'll be good to go. So, and then next in your engineering notebook, go ahead and answer these questions. And you can also do that on your, um, Word document or your Google document. And then here is what to submit. We kind of talked about those a little bit. Submit a picture on DSD Canvas of the game that you've created. 
and then also submit pictures on DSD Canvas of your work from your engineering notebook. And then if you did your work in a Google or a Word document, upload that document to DSD Canvas, no links. So that's what we're covering today. Here's our class discussion questions to help you see if you are able to uh, understand what's going on in class today. And that's it, congratulations. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.